Hi everyone, my name's Amy. I'm a member here at Hope Community Church and it's lovely to be with you this morning. I should get all my notes and my Bible ready. Okay, so hope everyone's had a lovely half term, those that have been off for the week and um, a nice rainy day to welcome us into the new week. So um, in the last week, I think anybody that has been studying and looking at the book of Isaiah with us as a church has been reading chapters 40 to 42. Have you all got on with that? All right? Yeah? Good, good. Anybody want to share? No. Okay, so <laughs> we know now that the people are in exile, but Isaiah has been prophesying over their future, hasn't he? So we're entering a season of hope and encouragement, and it's starting to get really exciting now. And so he's been speaking about comfort and hope. And this coming week, we're going to be diving into chapters 43 to 48 where you'll be pleased to know that we're continuing this message of hope. It's a great few chapters of I've been studying it over the last few weeks. Um, it's really encouraging, and I'd really encourage everyone to continue reading chapters 43 to 48. Today, we're going to predominantly be focusing on chapter 43, verses 1 to 7. And I'd really encourage you, because we're literally going to kind of pull it apart a little bit. So if you do have your Bibles on you, turn to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 7, or open your Bible up, whatever you want to do. But like I said, sort of packaging it all together, it's well worth exploring the full 43 to 48 this week. So I'm going to invite my one and only husband up to just read us chapters 43, <laughs> 1 to 7. One and only. <laughs> the one and only, James Longmore. Right, so he's going to read us chapters 43, and I think Javis, Joseph is going to pop it up on the screen for us as well. Sorry, little mic. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Got a laugh Hello. Right. Yes, good. Okay. Um, so, chapter 43. But now, thus says the Lord He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give you Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honoured. I love you. I give men in return for you, people in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, who I formed and made. Pretty good. <laughs> Tick. Thanks, James. Um, okay, so notice at the beginning of chapter 43, it begins with, but now. But now implies, doesn't it, that something has happened, which we know because we've been studying the book of Isaiah all the way through up until this point. We know that this has been, you know, chapters 1 to 39 was very much Isaiah's message of judgment and hope for Jerusalem, predicting that through Assyria, then Babylon, Israel's kingdom would come crashing down right? But now we're entering a period where the Lord has allowed his people to go into exile. But now we're entering this new season where the Lord is rescuing them. He's calling them out of exile. So we're entering a period of hope. And so the but now means and suggests to us actually something else is coming. But now something new is coming. And so he continues, but now says the Lord, I'll just stick that there. but now says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are 
are mine. Fear not. I have redeemed you. I have created you. I have called you by name. You are mine. It begins here with fear not. Fear not is a command from the Lord. He is commanding his people, they don't need to be afraid, fear not. It is a command that we are familiar with in the New Testament, aren't we, as well? Fear not, do not be afraid. And then it's followed by the promises of the Lord. The promises of not only who they are, but whose they are. He is not saying, I am going to redeem you. He is saying, I have redeemed you. Know that at, the mo at this moment in time, the people of Judah were afraid. They were afraid of the Babylonian army. They were afraid of being in exile. They had been in exile for 70 years. But here, God is trying to point them past their present and looking towards their future. The word redeemed. When we think of redeem, my first thought was, when I think of redeem, I think of, oh, we can redeem a coupon. Oh, they've redeemed themselves. But actually, in this context, it's very, very important that we understand what redeemed means, what redemption is. The Hebrew root, root word for redeemed is gal, G-A-A-L. And redemption was the purchasing of a slave back in those days. A slave in the marketplace. And actually the word redeemed or redeem is found 18 times in the book of Isaiah. The redeemer, who was usually a relative of some kind, somebody that was in slavery, would buy their relative out of slavery and out of debt. It was a price that that person who was in slavery, who was in debt, they could not pay themselves. So they were relying on their redeemer to buy them out of slavery or debt. It was a price that they couldn't pay. And actually, when we look back through the Old Testament, we can see in Exodus that, of course, God brought this nation out of the house of slavery in Egypt, didn't he? He didn't just bring them out. This was a mass exodus. I'm sure everybody knows the story where we see God at work in the most amazing way. And later on in this chapter, as you start to read through the chapters 43 to 48 this week, as you read through chapters 43, you'll see in verse 16, God reminds them of this. He says, thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. Of course, we know the story of the parting of the Red Sea where he brings them out of slavery. When God brought them out of Egypt, out of slavery, he then took them to the wilderness in Sinai. And he told them at this point, we can see in Deuteronomy that he said, you are my treasured possession. Israel were his treasured possession. They were a holy nation. And he said to them, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And now he is saying them, he's saying, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And even in verse 5, a little bit further down in the passages, he says again, fear not, I am with you. The commands twice, followed by his everlasting promises. After all these years in exile, imagine, just imagine how they must be feeling. But he is saying to them, I have not forgotten you. 
His assurance that no matter what choices they had chosen, what decisions that they'd made, what bad mistakes they'd decided to do, what circumstances or situation they were in, as dire as it was, as rubbish they were feeling, he is giving them hope for the future. And he is saying, don't look back, look forwards now. He is setting them free again. And therefore, their identity is in them. He is with them and they can trust him. They can have hope because God is the one who's called them and named them. And he is saying, you are mine. And as this chapter continues, the language, is, the language sort of changes a little bit. Um, when we look from cha- uh, sorry, verse 2 onwards. Because as we read this from um, verse 2, it says, it goes on to say, I've called you by name, you're mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. He lets them know that, you know what? This doesn't mean that there's not going to be hard stuff in the future. There is going to be hard stuff in the future. And there is going to be stuff that they're going to have to go through. But it's a reminder of the Lord's protection in all of these elements. And it reminds us of maybe some of the stories in the Old Testament You know, in Daniel, the three sons of Judah were cast into the furnace because they would not worship an idol. But of course, God protected them and they didn't burn. And so God is saying here to them that although they don't need to fear that they are his, that's a promise. That it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to face any storms or any fiery situations. They will and so will we. But God is promising them that he will be with them, that he will look after them, and that they will get through it. When you pass through the waters and through the rivers, when you walk through the fire, you will get through it. You will get through it. And maybe I wonder if perhaps at this point, these people are thinking, why is God doing this? Do we ever think sometimes, why is God turning our situation? Why would God do this to me? Or sometimes you maybe feel so unworthy. Why would God do this? Why would he have any interest in me? But the Lord quickly answers this. And he goes on to say in verse 3 and 4, For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Sabre in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honoured and I love you. No matter how much God is frustrated with these people. He is. We've seen it throughout the book of Isaiah. He is frustrated with these people. They are precious, honored, and loved. And he was going, he is rescuing them now. He is giving them hope for the future. And I just think that's just amazing. He goes on to say straight after this, like I just said before, fear not, I am with you. Verses 5 to 7, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Everyone. Isn't that amazing? And of course, um, these verses of hope, of hope are so powerful to recognize and remind us in 2022 of who God is. Because they also remind us and can point us towards 
Jesus. Because, of course, about 700 years after this point, God gave us much more than a nation. He gave his one and only son, Jesus. And through Jesus, through his death and resurrection on the cross, cross, we too are redeemed. He paid the price for our sin. He cleared our debt and we are completely forgiven and free. As I was preparing, I was reminded in the book of um, Ephesians, just need to find it, bear with me. In the book of Ephesians, if you look at chapter 1, verses um, 7 to 9, Paul is speaking to um, the Ephesians, and he says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. We too are redeemed and rescued. And the way the book of Isaiah points us towards God's ultimate rescue plan is wonderful. Our God is a God of redemption, love, and hope. And we will go through difficulties. We know that. We know that we are going to go through some turbulence in life. But what God promises the Israelites, he promises for us too. And why? Because he loves you. Because you are his handiwork. You are his masterpiece. And the Hebrew word for the word precious that he describes to these people in chapter 43, the Hebrew word is yaka, meaning highly valued. Precious means highly valued, highly esteemed, highly thought of. This is our identity. Jesus is our redeemer. Our identity is in him and through him. It got me thinking about identity because I think that this chapter 43 speaks such a lot of identity and who we are as believers of Christ. And I think a lot of us in some way, shape, or form, do struggle with our identity. Whether it's things that have happened to us in the past, things that we have experienced like Israel, and you know, things that we've experienced in the past, things that we're going through, past circumstances, maybe feelings of failure, feelings of disappointment, not feeling good enough, perhaps grief that has just left you lonely, and unsure of the path of life. There can be a whole host of reasons why each of us might feel captive and struggle to press forward. And it can hold us back so much. But then God went on to say to them, if we fast forward to um, verses 16 and 17, Sorry, no. Uh, Verses 18 and 19, the Lord went on to set them. And you're going to probably recognize these um, verses. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people who I'm formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. God is a God of new things. Remember, these people were in exile for 70 years. That is a long time. Some some of them are probably known no different. But God is a God of new things. And so when we feel hopeless, 
God is saying to us, you know what? Don't focus on what's been and gone. Let me take you to what's new. Trust me. He gives water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So no matter where you are, how dry you're feeling and desperate you're feeling, don't underestimate God. He makes a way. This is a powerful chapter as we see God's rescue plan for Israel from exile. But I think it is important for us in 2022, in terms of where we're at now, because it does point to Jesus, who is our redeemer. Identity is important, and we need to know who we are in Christ. And it's important that we understand what price Jesus paid for us and for you as an individual in order to be able to step forward into the new thing that the Lord has planned. And one of the first places that we need to go to, I think, is knowing our identity in Christ. I think he, we need to see, we need to believe, we need to be able to take hold of the new things. And I just want to pray this morning that he would show you this morning who you are in order for you to be able to step into the new. I just wanted to take a little bit of time now, really, to just be able to just spend a little bit of time with Jesus. Because I felt as I was preparing this, this identity piece is really, really important. But not only that, but actually there there is probably stuff that's holding each one of us back to be able to step into the new. It might be a case of um, you don't fully know your identity. You don't know what the Lord is saying to you because actually you're full of stuff and words from the past or words that you believe about yourself rather than actually what God says about you. This morning, I wasn't feeling very well last night. I went to bed really early. And this morning I woke up and I just felt the Lord say, I want you to look back at Isaiah 43 and write down some scriptures of encouragement based on actually what I'm saying to these people and what I'm saying to the people of today. And so that's what I've done. And I've, um, and feel free to take any way. I've done a few copies. But basically what I want to do is just ask some of the worship team or a somebody from the worship team to come up and just play as I just, I just want us to just close our eyes and I'm just going to speak some words of encouragement and truth over us, very much based on what the Lord is saying to Israel in chapter 43. And I just see this as a time where we are just going to hear as individuals from the Lord. Let the Lord speak to you. I just ask, Lord, that you would just clear our minds of all the stuff going on in our worlds right now. Remind us of what the Lord has perhaps been speaking to us about this morning from Isaiah 43. And we thank you, Lord, for this hope and encouragement and the new stuff that you have for us. That, Lord, you don't want us to be held back by our past or by stuff that's held us back from our past. That, Lord, you want us to step into the new 
and know the truth about who we are in Christ. Fear not, says the Lord. Whatever you are afraid of, whatever you are anxious about this morning, perhaps you are feeling captive. Perhaps you are feeling caught up in just stuff. If there's anything stopping you, From moving forward, the Lord says, fear not. Isaiah 44, 22, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, I have redeemed you. Psalm 56, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, Jesus. Lord, help us this morning to turn towards you. You, Lord, are the lifter of our heads. I pray, Jesus, that as we turn our eyes towards you, Jesus, that you would remove the fear, that you would fill us up, with your love and your peace. And it says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. I pray, God, that now I choose to put my trust in you. The Lord says, I have redeemed you. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, I have redeemed you. In 2 Corinthians, it says, The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lord, this morning we just claim your freedom in Christ. We pray, Lord, this morning that you would remove any anxiety, Lord, anything that is holding us back, from what you are calling us into, whether that's knowing our identity, the truth about who we are, or whether that is stepping into something new that seems scary. But Lord, we know deep down that you are calling us into it. Fear not, I am with you. It says in Matthew 28, verse 20, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are with us always and forever. That you are with us in our sleep. That you are with us when we wake up. That you are with us as we Um, go to bed at night, that Lord, you are with us in the workplace, that you are with us in school, that you are with us just walking down the road, minding our own business. Lord, you are with us when we are feeling scared. You are with us when we are worried. You are with us when we are filled with joy. Lord, thank you. Help us to know your presence in every single part of our lives. You are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. You are his treasured possession. You are precious to God. Thank you, Jesus, that I am loved. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me so much, that you love every single one of us so much, and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. 
Remember not the former things, the things of old, because I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? And as Katie said in the small talk, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We don't need to fear. We don't need to be afraid. We are forgiven. We can have a really close relationship with Jesus and know that we are loved and precious and honored And I just pray this morning that as we leave today, that we would know these truths. And that actually we are prepared and ready and choose to step into the new. In Jesus' name, amen. I think if, um, I know that Sue Pierce, I don't know if she's around. There she is. She brought an amazing word this morning as part of our prayer time. And um, I think she's hopefully going to share. And I think if anybody else, perhaps speak to the leadership team. But thank you. Amy's spoken quite a bit about um, stepping into new things and um, we've thought a lot about storms and um, not being on our own because God is with us. And yesterday when I was um, having my um, my quiet time, I had a picture um, which I thought was just for me at the time, but I think actually it's right to share it. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been sort of out on the coast when it's stormy and the winds are really battering and blowing you. And the only way that you can make any progress at all is to just tip your head down um, into the wind and just take one step at a time. Um, and that was the picture that I had. But in this picture, um, I was fighting against the winds that were blowing, but actually Jesus was with me and in front of me. Um, and sometimes I think when we're caught in those storms, to take the next step forward, which is all we can see to do, you just have to hang on to Jesus and know that he's with you, um, in front of you, and just leading you on to the, to the next thing. And you might not be able to see where you're getting to eventually, but just taking the next step, knowing that God is with you, um, is, uh, is all you can do. So if there's people there this morning, who, and you feel that's for you, then do come and um, get some prayer from one of the leadership team, or maybe people lurking at the back. Uh, I'd be happy to pray with you. Come on, Carol. Carol's agreed just to share a little bit of her story, her what's been going on in her life, because I think it feeds in really, really well with what Amy's been um, speaking about, what Sue just brought. Um, I'll come down here. So, Carol, just for those who don't know you, um, who are you? Um, I'm Carol. I'm married to Paul. He's over here. He's been coming to out for... I don't know, it seems like forever now, four years. <laughs> and we love having you. Um, some will know what's been going on recently, but I guess some won't. Um, you had a diagnosis recently uh, and some treatment. Do you just want to explain really quickly what, what that was? Um, I, I had um, cancer in my eye, um, and two days before the church weekend, I was told that the tumour in my eye was growing again and the treatment that I had the year before hadn't worked. And I was absolutely devastated. Um, And I was pleading with my medical team, don't make me have... uh, The the treatment had to be then to have my eye removed. And I was pleading with my doctors, please don't ask me to do that. I can't do it. 
uh, please don't ask me. <coughs> and that was on the Thursday, and at the weekend, it was our church weekend. And Sue brought a word at the beginning, and her word said, put down the things that have happened to you this week and let God do what he wants to do. And I left that service with just this overwhelming sense of peace. And on the following Tuesday, my oncology nurse from Sheffield rang me to tell me what the meeting had decided that they were going to do with my eye. And I, I said to her, before you say anything, I need to tell you that my eye has got to go. And she said to me, how have you come to that decision? And I explained to her, and she said, I'm a Christian as well. And there's this lady that had got to walk this journey with me that was also a Christian. And so the surgery was booked for the end of July. And then there was a, a service after the operation, wasn't there, where you had the shield in, um, where we talked about healing. Um, did God heal you? No, God didn't heal me because I had to have my eye removed. Um, when I went for my surgery, um, on the day that I had my surgery, the oncology nurse came to see me before I went to theatre and prayed with me, which was lovely. And um, when I got to theatre, um, I don't do veins at all. I had two anaesthetists transfect cannulas into my hands for the general anaesthetic. And it was like I was just above there, like floating, just looking down on it, just at this total state of peace with myself and everything that was going on around me. Then after my eye had been removed, then they put a conformer in my eye. Um, and we were at church and Matt was talking about um, seeing what God wants us to do. And the conformer just stayed in my eye. And while I was at the, in that service, I was sat over there and it came out and it was in my hand. And God was saying to me, you don't need that eye to see what I want you to do. And that is the only time it ever came out of my eye while we were in the church on that Sunday morning. And it, it's been, it's been, it's not been an easy journey and it won't be an easy journey going forward because though the tumour in my eye's gone, there's no guarantee that the cancer won't spread somewhere else. So I have to have surveillance every six months, but at the moment I'm just at peace with it all and every day is a new day and that I'm in that place because of God. Thank you. Thank you. Following Jesus doesn't mean we don't go through the fire, does it? In fact, sometimes the fire feels rather severe. But he's with us. And if you're going through the fire now, he's with you. And Sue said... We need to hold on to Jesus, and that is so true. But my experience is that as I've held on to Jesus, I realize he's holding on to me. Isn't that true? And there's so many things to be afraid of. So many things to be anxious about. And yet the promise is a promise of peace that he is with us. So we are going to sing and see what God wants to do, but I want to invite you to stand. And I want us just to, to claim that peace. You know, in a world that seems like it's going as crazy as it is, with new leaders every few weeks and prices going up and mental health crises and physical health crises and all the rest of it. I don't know about you, but it's so easy to lose your peace. So this morning, if, if you want to ask Father for some peace, if you feel like it's turbulent and you're churned up inside and that sense of peace that you promised just isn't your reality right now, if there's something he's called you into that you're really anxious about but you know is the right thing to do, whatever it might be, I'm just going to ask you to be really brave because we want to pray for you. So while everyone, just bow your head and close your eyes. And If, if you want to ask Father for that peace this morning that passes understanding, can I just ask you to raise your hand? Thank you.
Don't be afraid, get it on up. Father, you see every hand and you see every heart and you know every circumstance. So Holy Spirit, come now. Come, Holy Spirit, bring your peace that you promised. Cast out all fear, all worry, all anxiety. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and minister now into the places of fear and anxiety and worry. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe. Breathe on us, we pray.